Um, what we're going to talk about today in the next 30 minutes, I might go a little bit long, I hope they don't get mad at me, um, is what I call defending against the rad. Have any of you heard of the rad in this context? Okay, I've seen one of my presentations. Uh, so you'll learn more about that. That's kind of like the teaser. Uh, we'll get into what the RAM is about a third of the way into the presentation. Um, let's see, did that, did that? Okay. All right, so what's in the box? What are we going to talk about today? Um, I'm going to give you some little bits of information to hopefully provide some motivation to do some things around your home to make it more wildland fire safe. And then I'm going to show you some basic physics con con concepts really quick. This is not a physics class. I'm going to try to cover physics, a little bit of physics in five to seven minutes. We'll see how I do. I haven't done that yet. Um, and also at the end of this, I hope you walk away with the idea that doing structural hardening on your home, it doesn't have to be that hard. It doesn't have to be that expensive. And if you're here for anything other than my uh, structural hardening hacks, as I like to call it, um, then you're in the wrong space, but you can join in one. So the overall idea is to reduce the risk. When you have to evacuate, in my opinion, um, I like to evacuate with some sense of comfort knowing that my house has a fair chance of surviving a wild vampire when it blows through. That's what we're about. I use the lunar module here because that thing was not built for a forest. It was not built for an ocean. It was not built for flying around the globe. It was built for a specific environment, so it had to be specially built for that environment. We're seeing an environment that we're evolving to that we really need to build for, in my opinion. So here's kind of the takeaway here as part of the motivation. According to a December 2021 study from the National Bureau of Economic Research, a home built after the state updated um, wildfire standards in 2008, in 2008, into the building code and the residential code and the fire code, requirements for hardier built houses went into effect for homes in high and very high fire severity zones, those most at risk from wildfire. According to this study, 40% of those homes are less likely to be destroyed than a 1990 home with the same exposure. Some information there. That's my house. It is not 100% fire safe, but I'm working on it. I just limbed these up the other day on this side. Um, home hardening considers the relationship between your home and its environment. Um, your neighbor's house, um, how close the propane tank is, the trees, the vegetation around it, all those things. Um, and in a minute, I'll talk more about the rat. But overall, my concept is you want to build your, make your house as best you can to be defend against the big old bad boogeyman that I call the red, R E D. And we'll get to that. All right, this is a home garden home. I believe this is one of the homes that were rebuilt in Paradise as uh, one of the, it's an IPHS standard that this was built under, I believe. It's got, you know, the zero to five hardscaping gravel. It's got, I don't know if it has gutter guards on it or not, it probably does. Uh, you got the metal gate going on instead of the wood gate for the house, all that. This has a lot of the features that we're gonna cover today that honestly don't have to break the bank, I don't think. All right, visit. So anybody wanna time me, see how fast I can get through this? Um, everybody learned in grade school about the three things in physics that make fire. There's actually four things I won't go into the four. Um, fuel, heat, oxygen. If you've got a fuel, something that'll burn, um, you've got the fuel. If you've got heat, I don't have a lighter, um, you've got the heat. Or if this thing gets too hot, it can light. Or if a bag of sawdust gets too hot, it can light. If you use friction, um, when you're striking a match, 
that heat starts the sulfur burning on top of that match to get that going on. There's heat of friction. So those three things have to be in place to make fire. Well, we can't do much about the oxygen in regard to our house. Uh, heat, we really can't do much except keep our house away from heat as best we can. I got this, I don't have to stand in front of you there. There we go. And the fuel is in fact your house. So you could do something about this is you can make the fuel less likely to ignite. If you have a fuel that looks like this, it's a lot easier to burn than fuel that looks like this, right? So the bigger the boards on your house, the less likely a number is going to land there and ignite. Other thing to be aware of, heat increases logarithmically with the amount of fuel that's there. So if you've got one tree in your yard, it's going to put out a certain BTU or heat output. If you've got a whole bunch of trees in there, it's going to be a lot more heat coming from that. So that's a point to remember. Uh, there's conduction, convection, and radiation. Radiation is the heat you feel that comes through the air. Uh, the closer you get to a heat source, the hotter it gets, also logarithmically. If that table was on fire, I could stand here and be very hot, somewhat hot, a whole lot less hot, way less hot over here. So the farther you go, the cooler it gets, also logarithmically. So keep that in mind. Closer things are to something, um, combustible, the fire is as it gets closer, it's going to put out a lot more heat the closer that target gets. Convection is heat through either air or water. In this case, we're mostly going to be thinking about air. So in a windy um, event, uh, winds can blow fire and embers in that wind mass um, and push fire in a direction through uh, convection. Uh, and then, of course, there's conduction. If you touch something that's hot, like the lamp on that projector or something, you'll know right away because you've directly conducted it, you, you touched it. Um, for the purposes of this explanation, we're going to use the term direct plane contact as another term for conduction. So those three principles come into play. Water converted to steam, uh, conservation of water theory, I think it's called. Um, one drop of water, once it turns to its boiling point, 212 degrees Fahrenheit, will expand 1,700 times. So one drop will make 1,700 drops. What that does while it's doing that, it's absorbing heat. That's how firefighters put out fires, why we use water. You go in a building in a compartment, a lot of heat, put a little fog stream in there, shut your nozzle, get out, let this water turn to steam, suck all the heat out. Um, the steam also helps push, you know, uh, combustible products out, and then the fire goes up because you've taken the heat out and you're also helping to take a little bit of O2 out, oxygen out. So that's what's that. So the point of this is, if you have fuels around your house that are pretty moist, like well-irrigated plants, they're gonna hold up better than, you know, the pieces of your house that in some cases probably have been killed dry, or certainly have dried out over the 20, 30, 40 years lifespan of your house, very dry. Not a lot of moisture there. When we go through a drought for a long period of time, things dry out, trees lose their moisture. Littler fuels like this, light flashy fuels, lose their moisture quicker, become more hazardous faster than say, you know, a two foot diameter tree. So that's that point. Um, I talked about that. Um, let's talk about surface to mass ratio in this and jump off. So again, surface to mass ratio is the concept of smaller combustible particles burn easier, ignite easier, burn faster than bigger pieces. If I were to strike this with a lighter, um, this would ignite really well. In fact, this would be a good fire starter if you were killed. Um, this, you know, not so much. If I was out in you know, the woods and needed to start a fire, I don't know, which would you pick to start a fire if you had to make a campfire? Probably this one, yeah. And then you throw this on top, and then you throw the bigger piece on top of that. So that's how that works. That's the state of conservation, um, or surface to mass ratio. And the concept there is that the smaller the part combustible particle, the easier it is to ignite. And then um, the bigger it is, uh, the more energy it takes to ignite.
kind of there. And then the last thing I want to talk about is fire behavior related to wildland fires. There's another triangle. In the fire service, there's lots of triangles. Weather, topography, and fields. Weather, you can't do much about. You go through a 10 year drought, it is what it is. Can't do much about that. If you live on a hill, a south facing hill, where you get a lot of sun, a lot of heat, very often, can't do much about that. Maybe move. Um, don't move to Hawaii. And then there's fields. Again, that's your house and also the plants around your home. So those are things that you can do something about. You can't do much about the mountain. You can't do much about the weather, but again, you can do something with those fields, like your house and you know your surrounding um, combustibles. So this is the red. So with those concepts in mind, did anybody tell me that I do that in something? Probably six minutes. Twenty minutes? Oh wow, cool. Thank you. Thank you for timing me. Okay. So with those concepts in mind. The takeaway is when you leave here, remember, I want to prevent my house from being attacked by the red, R-E-D. So the first in the red is that radiated heat. And the way we do that is kind of reduce some thin vegetation that's close to the house. So um, when these things catch fire, the radiated heat will preheat this, make it easier to ignite, remember? Lower temperature, you know, easier to ignite. I mean, once it's dried out, it's easier to ignite, I should say. Um, this is flippable too. So this is meant to be protecting the home. This flips around. If your house was on fire, you want to keep the radiated heat from your house fire to getting into the forest. You want to keep it from getting into that natural resource. You know the three things that cause 98% of wildland fires in California? Men, women, and children. <laughs> Those three things. Yeah, Ronnie Coleman was one of my mentors. He used to be the California State Fire Marshal, and he told me that one day. He's like, Roberta, you should know this. What are the three things that cause 98% of fires in California? I don't know. Um, heaters? No, men, women, and children. Those are the things. It's the infrastructure, community development, things like that is where most fires start. Infrastructure, power lines. It's looking at, looking right now like the thing over the lawn at light was caused by down power lines. Are you guys having like, you guys, we just did that. Did you not learn anything from California? We just did this in 2017 and after and after. Come on, learn from us, you guys. That's so sad. So radiated heat works both ways. All of these work both ways. The E is embers in the R-E-D. -E. This is the worst. I'm going to focus a lot on embers. Um, studies have shown that this probably causes the most fire spread in the structure into the built environment than any of these other two things, embers. Uh, embers are terrible. I'll show you how that works in a moment with a practical demonstration. Uh, they go everywhere. They can be big, they can be little. Um, they can be as small as little bits of rice, like I have here, which I'll use for my demonstration. Um, but yeah, they're insidious. They go everywhere, and when they're blown by the wind, they can land on anything that's really like combustible. You get an ember or two on here, a little bit of draft on there, a little wind on there, poof, okay, there you go. It's next to your house, poof, there goes the house. In one case, one study, it was discovered that a lot of the homes in the footprint burned from the inside out. The embers got into the house and caused a fire in the attic or in the underfloor area, land on storage, materials, combustibles in the attic space or underfloor in other places and started that stuff on fire and the homes did not burn directly from the wildfire fire front. They burned from the embers getting inside, inside out. It's like a Trojan horse, you know, sneaking in there and destroying everything you own. And then the last is direct flame contact. This is where you have things right next to your house. If an amber lands, catches on fire, then you've got that direct flame contact. If you've got a wooden fence going all the way to your house, um, fence catches on fire way over here, burns, 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 burns. 
oh, look, there's a house here. I'm still hungry. I'm going to eat the house. Boom, the house gone too. Uh, so that's something to be aware of as well. So radiated heat, flying numbers, and direct plane contact. That's what you're defending against for structural heart. So how do we do that? Let me do my little demonstration here. I'll try not to do that. It's not that hard. Before 2008, most homes had vents with quarter inch mesh. It was a building code. Your vents have to be quarter inch vents, so many square inches per square feet or cubic uh, feet of area, I believe. You guys probably know that, contractor guys. Uh, but one of the things we learned that with quarter inch mesh, if you have like these embers, these are embers, I know it looks like glass, but it's not. If these are embers, these are embers, why are they there? These are the vents on your house. What's going to happen? Those embers are going into that space. Well, that's not cool. What do you do about that? Well, the code now says instead of quarter inch mesh, you can replace those with something with eighth inch mesh. Eighth inch mesh, let's see what that does. Like that, you're going off the side. Of course, that's good. Not nearly as bad. This does a lot. If you only take on one home improvement project to, to, do, to make your house more wild and fire safe, my recommend is switch out from those quarter inch vents to eighth inch mesh. That's what the code requires now for areas in the really uh, high and very high fire severity zone. It's not really that hard. It's easy for me, so don't ask me if I've done it on my own. <laughs> These guys are all around the house. Well, let me start there with the round bed. Those guys, you can take these. These are about two fifty each, fifteen dollars for six of them on Amazon. Uh, pack of six, fifteen. You have to right. So if these are those vents when you house way up high to attic. These are uh, bird stoppers or soffit heads. They go between the trusses and the rafter hills on the eaves. Buy these guys. These are actually smaller than one eight. Just get these bad boys and pop them in there. You have to get on a ladder. And boom, away you go. They don't look too bad. If you wanted to, you could probably find some paint on that to paint them. But be careful painting the mesh though, because the paint can be it off completely. You, your house needs to vent. I won't go into why. Your house does need to vent. Otherwise, things will get rotten and bad things will happen. These are called, I just looked up soft at them. This is a Franklin Louver company. There's other manufacturers. Mm -hmm. Would you know about him? These are my number one recommend. Not terribly expensive. Uh, for a couple hundred dollars, you probably do your whole house. But you do have to get on the ladder and have many men do it. Oh, by the way, I mentioned, you don't need a permit to do that. Permit not required um, that I'm aware of unless you have an HOA. I'm getting ready to do this, but I'm looking at the Vulcan. Are you getting the Vulcan? Um, that's what I'm hearing. Okay. Um, because those are about $45 a piece. I have 40 of them. And then I can put a higher contract to help you do it right. Yeah. It seems like, well, I don't have those. I have Okay, these are a similar project. These are the Vulcan. The only difference really is that it has this material here, that if there's a direct flame contact situation, these will close up that gap completely and help keep everything out of that space. In my opinion, if you have a nearby threat that you can't do anything about, like your neighbor's house, um, and it's very close, 
I would go to the welcome that's that's on that side of the house. This, I don't know if I mentioned it, fifteen dollars each. So forty five bucks to do each of these. It can get pretty expensive. Um, so it's up to you. More risk reduction, but I still think just popping in those two fifty dollar ones will give you a lot of bang for your buck without spending you know, a lot of money for the bulkheads. I'm not disking bulkhead products. I like them. Um, same with the underfloor. Let's look at that. Same sort of thing. Uh, for $4.98, let's look at this for our cloth and our These are $4.98 at a Home Depot plus tap. Um, you could pop these off, put these in place, or you can even go like this. Super thrifty way, or cheap, you can say cheap, right? <laughs> you can buy a roll of 8 inch mesh, 25 bucks for 25 feet. Cut it, delay, pop these off, put this behind there, put those back on, no repainting necessary. You both the same look. Just be careful when you take the screws or nails out. Um, yeah, don't bend anything. You can put those behind there, put this back on, it's not a problem. So I estimated that um, a roll of eighth inch mesh should do 20 bends if you do the math. These are about 14 inches long. Is it, I would put it behind for aesthetics. Is that too small? I don't know. The question is, Basically, if you do this, are you occluding the airflow to the point that it's going to be bad? I don't think so. I personally think it's a good trade-off. I have worked a little bit in construction, believe it or not. I built my house. Uh, and most of the time, now you construction guys, correct me if I'm wrong. I think most of the time when these go in there, there's more of them than technically need to be there if you do the math. So, and I really, I haven't done the airflow on this. Very scientific. I don't know. For me, I like, if I'm evacuating, uh, I would feel good about, better about this than this, even if there's a little bit of reduction in airflow, personally. But that's just me. Lorraine, do you want to talk about the Yeah. That's the Vulcan. That's like top of the line. With any of these Vulcan vents, if you're on a budget, my recommend is if you have, like I say, a, a hazard that's close, you know, if your propane tank is on that side of the house, if your name, messy neighbor, etc., if you've got a lot of vegetation that you want to keep there, then go ahead and spend the extra money, extra peace of mind, extra safety, extra risk reduction with the Vulcan vents on that side of your house. Um, on the side where you get most of your wind day to day, put them on that side because that's probably where the fire's coming from. So, I was a general contractor, you know, um, I would say on the eight inch compared to a quarter inch, it's mainly about reducing the moisture underneath your home than actually adding. Okay. And um, I was also a beekeeper. Putting the eight inch will reduce how many insects you'll have. I was going to mention that earlier. So, uh, a contractor or former contractor basically supporting what I have said. And with the addition of, it'll help keep the smaller critters out, uh, which I think is good. Actually, I think I have a critter in my attic. I was up there looking at something recently. A pile of nut acorns. And I didn't put them there. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't hear what was preferable about the Vulcan vents versus the Oh, if you have, if you're on a budget and can't afford to do everything with the high-end vents, like Vulcan, put those on the most at-risk face of your house. Great question. I'll pass it around. When heat 
get this was hit with a blowtorch for demonstration purposes. Please don't rip the plastic off because it'll get really messy. But when he hits the Vulcan back, this honeycomb stuff has an intermissive material which expands kind of. We're all old enough to remember those little black snake worms on Fourth of July. Same like that, same materials. Out. These will expand like those and close the gap off completely to keep all airflow out. If these do go off like that, you got to replace them with function. So, good question. Thank you for that, to be clear. Okay, so we did that. Caulking, right? How hard could it be? Put on your painter clothes. My recommend is Map 230. Takes about a week to dry before you can paint it if you are painting it. Um, but this stuff is great. It'll cover a significant gap. Not terribly expensive. 375 a tube, not bad. The amount you need is going to depend on how many gaps you're trying to seal. But you're trying to keep those embers out of nooks and crannies. The goal is nothing, no gaps bigger than an eight. Again, like the eighth inch screen. Um, so if you call it wide gaps, if they're really wide, you probably want to put a piece of trim in there and then clog the edges of the trim. But the idea is to keep out those embers and the critters as well. Keep them critters out. Caulking is not terribly expensive. How am I coming? I'm over here. Okay. Um, I thought I'd throw this in there, nooks and crannies. I had to look it up. According to the Cambridge Dictionary, nooks and crannies are small spaces in something or parts of something that are difficult to reach. Fences, I don't need to spend a lot of time on this. The idea, as I mentioned earlier, is to not have a combustible fuse right next to your house to light off this. Uh, easy fix, put in a chain link gate there, to break it up. Even if this is wood, in your gates over here, take out that wooden gate and put in a non-combustible gate. 111 24 Home Depot, I think a couple dollars less at Tractor Supply. Um, that's a way to fix that. Yeah, another easier, less expensive fix is if you do evacuate and you have a wooden gate, please put it on your evacuation plan. Open the wooden gate, set something very heavy in front of it so the wind won't blow it shut, so you break that continuity between the combustible fence, which is very easy to ignite in most cases, from lighting off your house. A lot of fires um, started, studies have shown many, I don't know if I have lots of that word, many fires have started, uh, homes have been locked because the fence, the, the vegetation catches the fence on fire, the fence catches the house on fire. Really easy thing to take care of. Now, disregard all this, that's not my house. <laughs> if you have a roof, like a metal roof or a tile roof, and you've got some gaps, you want to grout those or caulk those, um, sack a mortar mix, probably about 60 bucks, color, probably $40 to get color that matches whatever you're trying to match. Uh, mix it up. Again, it's more ladder work, uh, but you know, embers can get in here. If you've got one of those metal roofs over an old roof, uh, really thin gauge metal, those are really bad because they're all wooden cleats and embers get into there. That, that can be a mess. Make sure there's no nooks and crannies for these guys. Embers to get in anywhere. Rain gutters, uh, more ladder work. Uh, cover them up and then make sure that they're clear a couple times a year. A lot easier to clean stuff off of this than it is to dig it out of that trench. Uh, oftentimes with this, you might even be able to just reach up there as best you can from a ladder and blow things off with a leaf blower. Um, one thing I want to point out here is this looks to me like, I don't know how well you guys can see it, but it looks to me like this rain gutter was installed kind of like after the roof. Um, you know, the rain gutters when they're installed can go two ways. One, before the roof sheeting material, the roof covering goes on, or after. It's better if the rain gutter goes on first and your shingles go on after, because then you don't have an exposed wood edge. In this case, it looks like there might be a little bit of a 
a wood and a chair. So I like that they built covered this. Uh, even still, this is this exposed wood edge can be a problem. All right, I'm going to have to speed things along here. Uh, weather stripping around doors and windows, uh, always a good idea. Remember, anything greater than an eight, you want to try to squeeze down. Uh, all of these things so far are pretty inexpensive, no permit required. Skylights, if you, they're wide open, again, eighth inch mesh, eighth inch screen, hardware cloth, it's called sometimes in larger sections, cover those up. Uh, if your chimney, if you're, you're allowed to use your chimney or your fireplace, uh, make sure it has a, a, a fire arrester, spark arrester on it. Uh, for a new spark arrester, a couple hundred dollars. Uh, more ladder work. I say that a lot because I like ladder. I used to be on the truck companies with Santa Rosa Fire and ladders were no problem. But I've noticed the older I get, the less I like climbing ladders. Um, this is an interesting thing here. Um, if you've got a situation like this where you typically get an accumulation of woods or you know pine leaves, woods, leaves, pine needles, stuff like that to build up there. Um, not a bad idea to put some flashing here. You know, they've got some flashing here, kind of like that. But up here, if it goes along the roof and then up the side wall a little bit, uh, and then caulk really well, so you don't get water or embers in there. Uh, in a perfect world, you have nice metal flashing underneath there. But even if you have that, if this is combustible sidewall, if you get that build up of you know the smaller materials and an amber gets there, it can get that sidewall going. Even if you have a class A roof, you don't have a class A sidewall. So that's something to be aware of. Of course, the flatter, the more flat that arrangement is, the riskier. Um, but take a look at your house and see if you have nooks and crannies where things are, you know, accumulating. Um, windows. Put shutters on them if you don't have, you know, the double pane temper glass, uh, the A way, a little. As you notice, I started with the easiest and we're getting to the harder stuff. Uh, it's an idea. Uh, we just did a presentation on Fire Safe Sonoma. Uh, we do a, a monthly show, we call it our speaker series. And on um, Thursday, it's the third Thursday of the month from two to three. It's on YouTube, we live stream it, and then we do it virtually as well. But um, this past Thursday, we had some folks from the California Commissioner of Insurance Commissioner's Office. Um, and one of the things she said that insurance companies are accepting in lieu of the wooey windows, double pane tempered glass, is shutters. So that's an idea, you know. Put, put some shutters on there. Again, they have to be tight enough to where embers won't get in there. Okay, I'm going to move on. What's your YouTube channel? Uh, fire safes. Oh, um, if you go fire safe Sonoma YouTube, you should hit it, um, and that should be up. Oh, something live streamed. I don't know if our post production guy trimmed it yet, but it, it should be up. Um, windows. If you're replacing your windows, replace them with the good ones. Even if you're not in a high or very high fire severity zone, I recommend this. You know. If you're replacing them, go ahead and do that. You're going to get double pain anyway for your energy. Um, get them with a section of tempered glass, and they won't break. And then when people ask, well, what side should the tempered glass go on? Nobody, you know, there's no requirement there. You have children that play mostly inside or outside. <laughs> if they play mostly inside, put the tempered glass on the inside. If they play mostly outside, put it on the outside. Uh, and then, of course, if you're replacing your roof, definitely put a, put a Class A roof on. I don't think you're allowed to do anything less than a Class A roof in California. I am out of time. I don't think we have time for questions because I'm already over time. Um, what was that about the roof? Um, yes. Yeah. So most of this is not. Tara, and I took questions along the way, so I'm to talk about it. Maybe just a couple of real quick questions. I think I might have five minutes. What did you say about plastic? Did you say something about plastic? Plastic? No, I, I don't think I said anything about plastic. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay. Uh, I think I'm on time. All right. Well, thank you guys. Oh, okay.